Before leaving, please remember to make a contribution to all of my uh, thousands of hours of work uh, uh, here, uh, PayPal, Patreon, or fundraiser in the description below or on the China Rising Radio Sinoland art article page. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio Sinoland, and uh, today is a Chinese film, culture, and history uh, installment in the series. Uh, this is about the movie The Founding of a Republic with English subtitles, as explained by Dr. Quan Lo. Pictured above, an outtake from the 2009 Chinese reenactment movie the founding of a republic. Note before starting, you can download the full-length film at the end of this article with English subtitles. Let's start. This Chinese film, culture, and history installment discusses the 2009 movie, The Founding of a Republic. It concerns the period of time from the end of World War II, 1945, until China's communist liberation in 1949. The original Chinese title is Qian Guo Da Ye. The liter literally, it means the grand endeavor of establishing a nation. So the founding of a republic is a satisfactory equivalent for the English translation. The film covers the period from 1945 to 1949 and lasts 2 hours and 14 minutes. The movie was premiered in mainland China on September 16, 2009. It was posted on YouTube in February 2010, but without English subtitles. It had been commissioned by China's film regulator and made by the publicly funded China Film Group, CFG, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. Note that a Chinese century does not last 100 years, but 60 years, according to the traditional sexagesimal cycle calendar. So it was the celebration of the first, quote, Chinese century, end of quote, of the People's Republic of China. The film was co-directed by Huang Jianxin and China Film Group Chairman Han Sanping. The star-studded ca star cast includes Andy Lau, Ge Yo, Hu Jun, Leon Lai, Zhang Ziyi, Donnie Yen, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Zhao Wei, Zhang Guoli, and Tang Guoqiang playing the role of Mao Zedong. Most of them waived their fees, so the budget was maintained at a modest $10 million. When speaking of such giant historical figures, it is obvious that my modest capsule will offer nothing really encompassing, but only a certain perspective viewed from a specific angle I chose. I would like to draw your attention to a number of similarities and differences. Do not expect a sharp, documented historical presentation, nor flawless, precise biographical details from me. My remarks are at the level of metaphor and poetry. I suggest it watching at least the first 10 minutes of the founding of a republic, especially the scene where Mao Zedong born 26 December 1893, died 9 September 1976, and Chiang Kai-shek, who in, in Pinyin, uh, in Mandarin, is uh, Jiang Jie, Jie He was born 31 October 1887, died uh, 5 April 1975, are shaking hands at 3 minutes and 45 seconds under a giant portrait of Sun Yat-sen, a.k.a. Sun Wen, born 12 uh, November 1866, died 12 March 1925, also known as Sun Yi Xian. Sun Wen is also known as Zhongshan Xiansheng, Mr. Zhongshan. 
The time is August 28, 1945. Mao Zedong flew from Yan'an, his revolutionary base, to Chongqing, the provisional capital of the Republic of China, in order to meet his arch rival for leadership over China, Jiang Jieshi. Thus, the three defining players in China's long march from the downfall of the Qing dynasty in 1911-1912 through the country's communist liberation in 1949 are portrayed in this scene. The great helmsman, a.k.a. Mao Zedong, a.k.a. the lofty progenitor of Baba Beijing, and that is Baba Beijing Gaozu, a.k.a. the lofty progenitor of the Red Dynasty, Da Hong Gaozu, before I elaborate on Chairman Mao Zedong, a word on Sun Wen, the, the founding father of the Chinese Republic. By training a Western educated physician, respected both by the nationalists and the communists, he elaborated the plan for China's short-term and long-term development, inspired by Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, born 1809, died 1869, and Henry Carey, born 1793, died 1879. Carey was the leading 20th, 19th century economist of the American school and chief economic advisor to U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. What is accomplished now by the CPC, the Communist Party of China, and President Xi Jinping, born June 15, 1953, is the concrete realization of a plan created by Sun Wen a century ago, including the immense railway network. Sun fled China in 1895 after the failed coup that year to overthrow the Qing dynasty only to return 11 years later. Needless to say, he was not idle during that decade when he was abroad, as he worked tirelessly to expand the Chinese revolutionary network. He was the first president of the Chinese Republic, proclaimed on January 1st, 1912. He was also the first leader of the uh, Guomindang, uh, AKA KMT, AKA the National People's Party. Swin's chief legacy, inspired by Lincoln, is his political philosophy, the three principles of the people. San Min Zhu uh, Jui. And they are, the three principles are uh, Min Zhu Jui, which is nationalism, but I prefer national sovereignty. It means independence from foreign domination. Number two, Min Chuan Jui, the rights of the people, and some would say call it democracy. And then Min uh, uh, Min Sheng Jui, the people's livelihood. Everything the CPC and Xi Jinping are doing now is a direct consequence of these three principles. Now a word on the three Sung sisters, daughters of the wealthy businessman Charlie Sung, born 1861, died 1918, who helped Sun Wen tremendously. The two men met in 1894 and saw they were kindred spirits. Sun Wen was five years younger than Charlie Sung. The three daughters were Sun Qingling, born 1893, died 1981, married Sun Wen in 1915, despite a big age difference. Sung Mei Ling, born 1898, died 2003, married Jiang Jie Shi in 1927. Sun Ai Ling, born 1888, died 1973, married to Kong Xiangxi, aka Dr. H.H. H. Kung, born 1881, died 1967, and they married in 1914. Kung was a banker from a banking family, the richest man in the early 20th century Republic of China. 
and 75th generation descendant of Confucius, therefore a scion of the Xiangying royal house. He served as premier of the Republic of China from 1 January 1938 to 20 November 1939. Kung then served as vice premier of the executive from 1939 to 1945. Kung served as China's chief delegate to the International Monetary and Financial Conference in 1944, where he signed the Bretton Woods Accord. He was an early supporter of Sun Wen, a.k.a. Sun Yat-sen. Chong Shan is Sun Wen's social name, also called courtesy name, an extremely old habit, language habit, going back to ancient times, when the members of the gentry and the nobility uh, were called in polite society only by their um, social names. The members of the Chinese upper class and some of the middle class kept that habit alive until 1949. In some families living in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, Southeast Asia, and the West, it has survived be informed that people of lower social origins might also have a sobriquet, a, a so, it's hard to pronounce in English, sobriquet, I guess in English it's sobriquet, an equivalent to the social name of the bigwigs and the semi-bigwigs. The proper name of what is called a Mao suit in the West is Zhongshan suit, Zhongshan fu, because it was Mr. Zhongshan who gave his instructions to a tailor to create that specific design, each element representing symbolically a virtue needed for good governance. Note that the translation given by the movie's subtitles is debatable, but can be seen as a third possibility, Mandarin suit. There is certainly a bittersweet irony that a feudal language habit served to name a jacket symbolizing revolutionary virtue. But why not? Lao Tian Ye Shi Kai Wan Xiao Zui Gao Shou. And in, Ch in Chinese, that means God, or it could also be heaven, is the best joker. And then there's a short um, a little uh, documentary about uh, the man behind the uh, Sun Yat sen um, suit. Another foundational moment of Chinese culture. They were trying to reach a middle ground during the summer of 1945. History tells us that the attempt failed, and four years later, the leader of the uh, Guomindang uh, Dang, the National People's Party, Jiang Jieshi, fled to Taiwan, probably hoping to return one day, but we know that never happened. And Mao Zedong became the ruler of China as the leader of the Zhongguo Gong Chandang, the CPC, the Communist Party of China, or the variant by Kishore Mabubani, the CCP, the Chinese Civilization Party. Here we also have a victor, Mao Zedong, and a vanquished, Jiang Jieshi. As there was a social difference between the peasant son of Heaven Liu Bang born 256 BCE, died 195 BCE, aka the lofty progenitor of the Han Dynasty, Han Gaozu, and the one he vanquished, Ying, scion of the Ying noble house, there is also a social difference between the peasant son of heaven, Mao Zedong, and the one vanquished by him, Jiang Jieshi, who was from the gentry. But what is more meaningful about this latter pair is that they both share the same spiritual father, Sun Wen, and like all good family tragedies, both claim to have accomplished the ideals and desires of their spiritual father, Sun Wen, while denying such feat to his opponent and brother. And more importantly, as with Liu Bang, and Ying, Mao Zedong and Jiang Jieshi are forever together in the minds and hearts of the Chinese people. When Liu Bang accepted Ying's surrender and his dynastic seal at the side of the uh, Chi Road 
at the end of November 207 BCE, a new world order came into being. When Mao declared from the heights of the Gate of Heavenly Peace, Tiananmen, the founding of the People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949, a new world order came into being too. Know that the People's Republic of China is a wishy-washy translation of Zhonghua Zhenmin Gong He Guo. I much prefer the following translation. The Commonwealth of the Commonwealth of the Peoples of the Splendid Central Civilization. Mao Zedong was born on December 26, 1893 in Shaoshan, east of Xiangtan City, Hunan Province. I've been there. It's, it was an amazing trip. He grew up under the strict supervision of an old-fashioned peasant, his biological father, who died in 1920 when the great helmsman was 26 years old. Mao remembered him as being authoritarian, authoritarian and not willing to let him go to school. His mother was a devout Buddhist called Wen Chimei, and Chimei means seventh sister, who was willing to let her son go in the direction of his heart's desires. He had two younger brothers. Their mother died in October 1919, and there is a moving photo of the four taken together uh, sometime uh, before her death. I talked about Mao's spiritual father, Mr. Zhongshan, a.k.a. Sun Yat-sen. Now let's talk about three of Mao's mentors. Number one, Zhang Guanying. He was born in 1842 and died in 1922. While working on his father's farm, Mao read voraciously and from Zhang's booklets developed a clear image of China's setbacks in the modern world and the need for reforms. Zheng was in favor of women's rights. Number two, Yang Changji. Uh, he was born in 1871, died in 1920. And then number three, uh, uh, Qin Du Xiu. Born 1879, died 1942. Mao desired to become a teacher and enrolled at the Fourth Normal School of Changsha, the capital city of Hunan province, which soon merged with the First Normal School of Changsha, widely seen as the best in Hunan. He began his curriculum in 1912, and when he graduated in 1919, he was the third of his promotion. During those years, he actively participated in the social, intellectual, and local political life of Changsha in Beijing. He visited Shanghai too. Uh, Professor uh, Yang Changji befri befriended him and introduced him to a radical newspaper called Xin Qingnian, meaning New Youth, supervised by uh, Qin uh, Duxiu. Chen Duxiu co-founded the Communist Party of China, the CPC, in July 1921, and with Li Dajiao, uh, and that is uh, Li Dajiao, born 1889, died 1927. Li Dajiao helped build a united front between the CPC and Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party in early 1924. Mao was invited to be part of the founding members of the CPC in July 1921 when he was 27 years old. Chen Duxiu was uh, the first general secretary of the CPC between 1921 and 1927. Professor Yang Changji was considered one of the best philosophers of his generation before his premature death at 48. In 1917, when Yang had taken a job at Beijing University, often called Beida, Mao also moved to Beijing. Yang was a vital source for Mao with his, with his peasant background to gain self-confidence and entry into the world. Yang thought Mao exceptionally intelligent and handsome. Yang secured for Mao a position of assistant librarian at Beida, the pay was low, 
but Beijing was dazzling and Mao had a new world to discover. He was snubbed by the children of the big wigs and semi big wigs because of his Hunan, <laughs> Hunanese accent. And if you ever listen to Mao recordings, he really had an accent. So did Deng Xiaoping from um, uh, what, his Sichuan accent. They really had him and his rural upbringing. But he also met open-minded people. So his sojourn in Beijing was an absolute boon for his training. At the end of 1919, he even went to Shanghai to say farewell to his friends leaving for Europe. Mao was forced to marry Luo Yixiu, born 1889, died 1911, by his father when he was 14. The marriage was never consummated and Luo, uh, Luo died of dysentery. Professor Yang Changji gave him his daughter, Yang Kaihui, uh, born 1901, died 1930. They married in 1920, and Kaihui became a member of the CPC in 1922. In October 1930, the local KMT warlord, He Jian, captured Yang Kaihui and her son, Mao Anying, her captors wanted her to publicly renounce Mao Zedong and the CPC, but she refused to do so. Even under torture, she was reputed to have told her captors that, and I quote, you can kill me as you like, but you will never get anything from my mouth. Chopping off someone's head is like the passing of wind. Death could frighten cowards, but not us communists. Even if the seas run dry and the rocks crumble, I would never break off relations with Mao Zedong. I prefer to die for the success of Mao's revolutionary career." End of quote. Now you know why the communists won. <laughs> Yang Keihui was executed in Changsha on November 14, 1930, at the age of 29. Her children with Mao Zedong were effectively orphaned and were re rediscovered years later. Uh, they were Mao Anying, uh, Mao Anying, born 1922, died 1950. He died fighting in the Korean War. Uh, Mao Anqing, born 1924, died 2007. He worked as a researcher at the Academy of Military Sciences and the Publicity Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. Mao would have relations with other women, but Yang Keihui had a special place in his heart. The, infam <clears throat> the infamous Madame Mao of the Gang of Four, aka Jiang Qing, born 1914, died 1991, born, yeah, 1991 was Mao's last wife. There is an obvious common factor in the formative years of the three famous peasant sons of heaven, each founding a great dynasty. Each of them met people recognizing there was something unique in them, thus giving them the education and refinement they lacked while introducing them to the world, boosting their self-confidence and confirming their sense of mission by naming their identity as a son of heaven. And we have already uh, talked about in another in, uh, China in, in another film installment, uh, uh, Liu Bang, born 256 BCE, died 195 BCE, aka the lofty progenitor of the Han Dynasty, aka Han Gao Zhu, Zhu, pardon, pardon me. There were many, but the one, uh, but the one was Liu Wen. The first time he met Liu Bang, he was so impressed that he gave him his daughter, Liu Zhi, born 241 BCE, died 180 BCE, the future empress. The next peasant uh, to become uh, emperor, Zhu Yuanzhang, born 1328, died 1398, aka the supreme progenitor of the Ming Dynasty, aka Ming Taizu. There were also many, but the one was Marshal, uh, as in you know military leader, military leader Marshal Guo Zixing, who died in 1355. 
Zhu Yuanzhang met Marshal Guo in 1352. Within a year, he married Guo's adopted daughter, the future Empress Ma, uh, born 1332, died 1382. I would like to add Li Shangchang, uh, born 1314, died 1390, a Confucian scholar. The two met when the future emperor was 25 in 1353. Uh, Li gave Zhu a summary of Chinese history and told the young man he had the qualities of a former of a former peasant son of heaven who lived 1,600 years before um, Han Gaozu, of course, uh, Liu Bang, who was the son of heaven of his day. This young man kicked the Mongols out of China in 1368, 15 years after the interview with Li. And then the third uh, peasant Son of Heaven, Mao Zedong, born 1893, died 1976, and his pinyin uh, is Mao Zedong. It's really strange. It's kind of bizarre trying to pronounce, the, speaking English, uh, and trying to pronounce names and uh, with uh, with the correct pinyin because it's just it's just like it's um, anyway. It's okay when you're speaking Chinese, but <laughs> to try to remember to do it while you're speaking English is interesting. AKA the lofty progenitor of Baba Beijing, AKA Baba Beijing Gaozu. And we already know that one was Professor Yang Changji, who gave him Yang Keihui, his daughter, and that she was martyred for him and for a better China. Mao Zedong was given an appraisal by Baba Beijing when Deng Xiaoping, born 1904, died 1997, was the paramount leader. It was announced at the 12th Party Congress in 1982. Mao was 70% correct in his leadership and 30% for demerits. That year, the Chinese population reached a billion, a quarter of the human population at the time. When Mao entered Beijing in 1949, the Chinese population was around 550 million. In one generation, it practically doubled. In 1949, the average life expectancy was somewhere between 35 and 40 years of age. It was 65 when Mao died, and now it's 77. The literacy rate was around 20% in 1949. Six years after the death of Mao in 1982, it was about 62%, and now it's practically 100% in the cities and above 90% in the countryside for a national average in 2018 of 96.84%. Here I need to disagree with Baba Beijing. 70% correct is quite unfair to the great helmsman, taking into, taking into account not only the above numbers, but many other criteria. I suggest four questions to assess a leader. 30% for each of the questions 1, 2, and 3, and only 10% for question 4. Those four questions pertain to the past, the present, meaning the time he ruled, the future, and on his personality. Questions. Question, question number one. Did he make a difference compared to the past of his country, the last 5,000 years in this case? Question number two. What is the appraisal for the time he ruled, 1949 to 1976? Number three. Did he manage to transfer power to someone not only worthy, but outstanding? And question number four, did he manifest the personality of a leader? Answers. Answer number one, Mao Zedong opened the doors for a completely new order after 22 centuries of empire and 40 centuries of monarchy. True, the revolution of 1912 already began the work, but the revolution of 1949 uplifted it to a new level. Under the guidance of the teachings of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, the, overthrow, uh, the overthrown hereditary monarchy was probably less detestable most of the time in China than elsewhere, but it's still a form of domination, even if the meritocratic system of the imperial exams made it less obvious. Still, for this undeniable breakthrough, I give him 30 out of 30. 
Answer number two. For the time he ruled, 1949 to 1976, I simply invite you to look again at the numbers I gave above concerning population growth, literacy rate, and life expectancy. However, he caused some significant sufferings with the Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1960, and the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1977, that I cannot ignore. So I give him 20 out of 30 for this question. Answer number three. Just by transferring power to Deng Xiaoping, he deserves 30 out of 30 on this one. Deng had been exiled during the Cultural Revolution and recalled to Beijing by Mao in 1973. We all know that uh, Hua Guofeng, born 1921, died 2008, had been granted the titles of Premier Vice Chairman of the CPC Central Committee and Premier of the State Council Prime Minister during the last months of Mao's life, but really, let's be serious, Deng had been well protected from harm before Mao died. And let's not forget Deng's towering and unrivaled prestige in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. Don't be fooled by Deng's diminutive physique. He was quite a strategist and recognized as such by the PLA as he played a vital commanding role for the Huai Army in the years 1945 to 1949 during the heroic communist conquest of mainland China. As was expected, a week or so after giving the eulogy speech for the late Premier Zhou Enlai, born 5 March 1898, died 8 January 1976, Dun left for safe abode in the southern city of Guangzhou near Hong Kong. In April 1976, during the Qingming Festival, a moment of family gathering to commemorate ancestors and sweep their tombs, there was a clash between many Beijing citizens wishing to pay tribute to late Premier Zhou Enlai, who had died three months earlier, and government officials. Deng was scapegoated for inciting the fight from afar Les absents ont toujours tort, which in French means uh, those who are absent are always wrong, <laughs> and stripped of all his titles. It was part of the conspiracy of the Gang of Four to eliminate him. At Mao's behest, Dung retained his membership in the CPC, his last asset, asset on the eventual road to return to power. Here I have to say that for a reader of Chinese history, all, these sh all those shenanigans, court cabals, displacements of persons and removal t of titles are absolutely pathognomonic of a dying leader trying to protect his true heir in the midst of conjurations of opposing factions that he can no longer control because of his weakness. Mao recognized Deng Xiaoping as his true heir because he saw Deng as worthy and truly outstanding. A coalition of Mao slash Deng loyalists put an end to the Gang of Four. Uh, these loyalists were uh, Hua Guofeng himself, Marshal Ye Jianying, born 1879, 1897, I'm sorry. 1897 died 1986, and the technocrat Li Xianyan, born 1909, died 1992, along with the courageous, unswerving, and skillful assistance of the forever faithful Wang Dongxing, born 1916, died 2015, commander of the elite 8341 Special Regiment, aka the Central Guard Regiment, aka the Central Bureau of Guards. On October 6, 1976, Three of the Gang of Four were arrested in uh, Hua Zhentang, I'm sorry, Hui Zhentang, uh, Hall of Cherished Compassion, uh, still is a meeting place of the Politburo of the CPC, and an alternative meeting place for the Standing Committee of the Politburo of the Chinese Civilization Party, the CCP. This is the small group, the Standing Committee of the Politburo, is the small group of five to ten men at the top of China's ruling group. Huai Zhentang is part of Zhongnanhai, 
formerly part of the Forbidden City on its west side, which during olden times was formerly devoted to meditation, boating, and leisure, obviously for the royal families. Since 1949, uh, Zhongnanhai has been the Chinese government leadership compound in Beijing. The three arrested in uh, Hui Zhentang were Wang Hongwen, born 1935, died 1992. Uh, Yao Wenyuan, born 1931, died 2005. And then uh, Zhang Twinxiao, born 1917, died, ni died 2005 also. And Madame Mao, aka, AKA Jiang Qing, was arrested at her residence, 17 Diao Yutai, during the evening of the same day by a chosen unit of the elite 8341 Special Regiment. The 11th National Congress happened August 12 to 18, 1977, and declared officially and staunchly the end of the nefarious influence of the Gang of Four and the end of the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1977, even if most of the tumultuous events were between 1966 and 1969. Between October 1976 and December 1978, Hua Guofeng remained number one in the Chinese government, but with the army, some technocrats, and many powerful political men uh, uh, in Beijing favoring Deng as the true paramount leader, it was only a mere, a simple, a basic question of time before Hua was invited to accept ceremonial positions and afterwards a golden retirement. And that was what really happened. Mr. Hua died on August 10, 2008 at age 87, 11 years after Deng Xiaoping, and had the pleasure to see China's utter, radical, and dazzling transformation. Answer number four. The answer is obvious. If Mao did not display the personality of a leader, he would not have been recognized as such by the Chinese, unless the Chinese were idiots, <laughs> but trust me, most Chinese are not morons. However, I want to stress that Mao corresponds to the ideal of a Chinese leader and probably to the idea of a leader of any nation on earth. He was really charismatic, contrary to uh, Chiang Kai-shek, Mao was a scholar of Chinese history, writing poetry, was energetic and capable of physical action. He was good in strategy in the battlefield and was able to write war manuals too. He was tall enough, let's not forget he was a southern Chinese, and handsome at his young age. Those things matter. But above all, he was the living embodiment of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. He believed in his country and his people, contrary to certain petit bourgeois intellectuals brainwashed by the Western oligarchical machine, and was able to choose the right subordinates, a paramount, vital, non-negotiable quality for a leader. It was not the case for Jiang Jieshi, aka Chiang Kai-shek, whose government was full of moles, traitors, and prevaricators, I can also add it was an incredibly corrupt government. I mean, they stole billions from the United States. The long march from the end of 1934 to the end of 1935 established Mao as the undisputed leader of the CPC. Over time, Mao showed a strong proclivity for authoritarian behavior. He strongly identified himself with the first emperor of China and to the lofty progenitor of the Han Dynasty his model figures, so to speak, living two millennia before him. And he was absolutely right. Like them, he was a son of heaven. And why shouldn't he claim his belonging to this group of heavenly brothers? Needless to say, his spiritual father, Sun Wen, was also a son of heaven. The mausoleum the Chinese built for Sun Wen in Nanjing irresistibly evokes an imperial tomb. So I give Mao 10 out of 10 for this criterion. To sum up the four uh, parts, 30 over 30 plus 20 over 30 plus 30 over 30 plus 10 over 10 equals 90 over 100. Final score for the peasant son of heaven, 
Mao Zedong, 90%. Why? Because the great helmsman, Mao Zedong, lived his life. The little helmsman, Deng Xiaoping, was able to do his part. And the younger helmsman, Xi Jinping, now has what he needs to secure wealth and power. In Chinese, that is uh, Fu Qiang for the commonwealth of the peoples of the splendid central civilization. The next 20 years will see many changes in the world. We're living in dangerous and exciting times. Best Quan. And I hope you enjoyed my recitation of uh, Dr. Quan's um, uh, article and, um, and, and enjoy watching the movie. Don't watch just the first, watch the whole movie because the whole movie is just incredible. Have a great day. Bye-bye. China Rising Radio, Sign the Land, and China Tech News Flash signing out. Please make a contribution to all of my hard work. Thank you.